Charlie. Mark, one Charlie. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm full of optimism. Einstein's theory of relativity. And we're still seeing it quite well through that haze. T-minus 37 seconds. The fight is going e equals MC. That all men are created equal. About the future innovation. And growing strength in the air. This is Finding Your Frequency with your hosts, Jeff Spinard and Ryan Treasure. It's time to speak up, share your voice, and hear from the thought leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another great episode of Finding Your Frequency. I am your host, Ryan Treasure, and boy, do we have a bang up show for you guys today. I have a question for all of you listeners out there. How, how private do you think your lives really are? How much of your data is being taken without your knowledge and used against you for advertising on sites like Facebook and Twitter? Uh, and we all know how Google is. Google takes care of everything. They hoard it all. We live in a world now where the currency is data and not so much technology. He who holds the data holds the keys to the kingdom as it relates to certain things like advertising through multiple different means, whether we're talking about uh, your Amazon Alexa device that's in your house. Something happened to me that was quite strange. I was talking to my wife about buying a new computer. We were sitting in the kitchen where our Amazon Alexa device is and then as I was thinking about getting a new computer, I hopped on my phone and I jumped onto Amazon. And oddly enough, I was being shown ads for computers. And I was wondering to myself, how in the Lord did Amazon know that I was wanting a computer? And the only way I could come up with an answer was, they're always listening. You know that function on your phone where you say, okay, Google? Well. In order for that function to work, it has to always be listening. So we're gonna talk about some of that data and some privacy. We've got some great guests for you guys. One of our guests today is Cliff Boyle. He's the president, chairman, and founder of Simsbury Associates, chairman and founder of Landmark Technology Partners, and president and chairman of, uh, founder of Shazzle Incorporated. And then we also have Robert McGill, who's the chief technology officer for Shazzle. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome, good to be here. So, you know, as I was kind of starting the show, I was kind of uh, positioning some questions for uh, our audience to kind of think about because I think that, you know, there's a lot of things that people don't know about as it relates to their data and the privacy of that data. But before we get in the weeds on that, uh, you know, Cliff, I really want to know, you know, from you as, an, as a serial entrepreneur and owner of multiple businesses, how did you find your frequency in life and in business and why are you doing what you do? Well, in life... I like my liberty. I knew that when I was fairly young, certainly getting out of college, I said I did not want to work for someone else who told me what to do every day. And if I thought something was wrong, I had to do it the wrong way if he thought it was right. If I thought something was right, he wouldn't let me do it. You know, I like my independence. I don't like being told what to do. So I started my own business right out of college. Um, now I'm looking back on a lot of my work life and I've found my liberty has been very important. It's been important to my success. It's been important to my quality of life. And I want to try to help preserve that liberty, of course. It's been important to me for others, including my children and five children. I, and I understand that we need to preserve privacy to preserve liberty. We can't give all the information about ourselves to certainly the government. Uh, we don't want to give them to Google, et cetera, either, but it's even more important not to give them to the government um, because those that know everything about us can find ways to try to control us. So I started Shazzle, and the goal was to get us off the web where we were being spied on. You, know, you mentioned a couple of the ways in your introduction. There are many other ways we're being spied on, and there is no way to avoid being spied on if you use the web. Yeah, and that's a scary thought. I mean, you have, you know, millions and millions of people around the globe who are on the net, you know, because I don't know, whatever the case may be. I love Google searches, right? I mean, everybody does. I love to just look stuff up and kind of go down the rabbit hole. Wikipedia is a great resource. and uh, But every time you go online, you're really sacrificing something um, as it relates to, you know, lots of different uh, methods. I mean, I even know that 
every time you jump online, you know, it's creating a log file that contains your IP address and your IP address directly correlates to your geographic location. That's kind of scary. Well, yeah, it can relate. And for most people it does. And there's a distinction between going online and using the web. Uh, the internet can be used in some ways that are relatively safe and private. It's just the client server configuration of the web, the World Wide Web, that protocol WWW uh, is inherently uh, non-private. Everything that you do, everything you type in, all your data goes into a central source, usually a tech giant. And it's an easy spot for the National Security Agency or other government agencies to collect information and spy on you. So not only you're giving your data away to the tech giants, you're being spied on at the same time. And we wanted to get to allow people to get off the web. And what we realized was that people walk around with a computer chip almost all the time that's much more powerful than servers were, uh, maybe even as recently as 12 years ago when we started the company. And it's in your smartphone. But we don't have architectures and applications that use our computer chips on our phones as servers. What your phone does, it has a browser, it brings you to the web and keeps you on the web, which is of course where Google wants you, it's where Apple wants you. It's not where I want to be. I don't want them having all my data. I don't want the government spying on me. You know, I'd rather let the U.S. government spy on me than the Chinese or Russian government. Um, I'm sure the people, a lot of people in China and Russia don't want to be spied on, but how do they avoid it when there aren't applications that get them off the web? We've built an application to allow people to get off the web and still be able to communicate. Yeah, that's that's definitely a, a very good tool. Um, you know, you talk about, you know, applications and smartphones and stuff like that. That's one of the things that always boggled my mind about an application. You know, you, you download an application for, you know, whatever the case may be. Like I, I downloaded a game the other day. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, uh, transformers, right? So they have this really cool transformers game for your, for your Android phone. So I download it and as I'm downloading and installing it, it's asking me for access to my contacts in my phone, my microphone, like all of these different things. And I'm saying to myself, why the hell do they need access to my contacts for me to just play a, a silly video game? But then again, I'm thinking about, well, also this game was free. So I'm basically giving up my data to play something for free, um, which is inherently giving up some security and some liberties of myself um, all to just to play a free game. Yeah, when you call it free, I would say it's not free. You're paying a price. Yeah, I agree. And the, the, your da data is, the, the data, your data is, the is price. Your data is valuable. Your data is valuable to companies, not only the tech companies, but the companies they sell your data to. And you're not getting paid for your data. You're giving it away. So is that game you're playing free? I would argue it's not. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I guess by free, I was just mentioning that it's it's free on the app store, but you know, not free to not right. free to me because I'm I'm giving up my data. But um, it's an interesting concept that you bring up about the uh, the chips in the smartphones and how powerful they are. I was having a conversation with another gentleman a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about space travel and some different things, and you know, it was interesting when he brought up the fact that you know the the smartphone that we have that we all carry around in our pockets are like 15 times more powerful than the computers that they use to land on the moon right and and knowing that that technology has progressed so far over time uh, and the computing power that's there and then you talk about you know things called the emergent web or a decentralized version of the web where things are more peer-to-peer -peer. that's kind of the idea behind uh, what shazzle is correct absolutely and I'd ask your li your listeners to consider why haven't these tech giants built any applications to allow them to harness the power of, of those server chips. And the tech giants are getting all this quote unquote free data from their users. And the tech giants are getting rich. You're giving up your data. They don't want to allow you to use your phone to control your own data, your own messaging, get you off the web 
and get you onto your smartphone in a peer-to-peer configuration that works just like the browser-based, web-based messaging services you have right now. You don't have to learn anything new. It's just traveling differently. It's not traveling the web. It's traveling the internet, but not the web. It's not going, your message when you use Shazzle doesn't go to Shazzle servers. It goes from your phone to your recipient's phone over the internet. It doesn't stop on anyone else's server. You don't have to trust Shazzle. Oh, trust me, it's encrypted. We'll delete it when we're done with it. (laughs) Just trust me the way some of these other apps do. You know what? You don't have to trust Shazzle. Trust yourself because you're the only one to get your data other than the person on the other end that you choose to have your data. And if you start thinking about this, and Bob knows this better than I do as a technical officer, the messages on the internet are not traveling into a central point. They're bouncing all over the place to get to the recipient. So how's the government gonna find them to spy on you? Right now, the government spies on you. You use WhatsApp, the government goes to Facebook, goes into their server farms, grabs all the messages. Easy, one central collection point. You go to any other app, same thing, not Shazzle. It's a really good point, Cliff. This is uh, Bob speaking. Uh, This is slow, but sure erosion of privacy has been a deliberate outcome of the evolution of the technology that we have, and it gets worse every single year. What you and I have done is simply put a new architecture in place that restores the control and the ownership back to the people who should have it, which are the people who own the data. Yeah, I 100% Absolutely. agree with you. And that's, you know, uh, Cliff and Bob, when you guys were talking about, uh, you know, the just trust me thing, I can't I can't help but think of uh, Snapchat, right? Because Snapchat was originally designed in a manner where, you know, once <clears throat> once, a, once an end user reads the message or sees the pictures or whatever the case may be, then they disappear and you can't see them again. And they, they would always tout that they don't hold them on their servers. They don't do that. And, oh, boy, did they get called out a couple of years ago in a big way. And uh, sure enough, they were keeping those messages and those photos on their servers, um, even though it looked like to the end user that it had gone away, it had gone away for them to view, but that content was still available in their servers. Uh, And so I kind of feel like you can't really trust anybody nowadays that are, you know, providing uh, those tools. but uh, uh, Shazzle Chat, in this example, I use that uh, on a daily basis uh, with some communications internally, uh, and, and it works really well. Um, and I know you guys, so I can trust that that's the case with you guys. But how, how would you convince anybody else um, who maybe uses WhatsApp, which is also supposedly supposedly secure, but we all know it's not? Um, you know, when, when you say, you know, Shazzle's uh, uh, chat function doesn't go from any servers, um, how do you explain that to somebody uh, and, and how, do, how do you get them to actually trust that that's, that's the case? How do, you, how do you get that verification as an end user knowing that all of that encryption is happening and it's not touching any servers? Well, we've been reviewed by Consumer Reports in 2014 for Shazzle Mail product, which was in development at the time. Um, it's not available for download today, but it has been in development. And, and so we have had this architecture vetted by Consumer Reports. They tested it. It's in their 2014 publication. We have patents at the U.S. Patent Office that describe the architecture, and we've received patents for the way that we connect the smartphones during a session. So the patent office has seen our technology, considered it unique and granted a patent. Uh, That should give people some comfort that we're unique and that we have been reviewed. Um, Of course, we welcome any reviews of any third parties who wanna look at our architecture and verify that when you send a message on Shazzle Chat, Shazzle does not get your message. And I'll add to that, these other companies that say, oh, it's encrypted, oh, we're gonna delete it. First of all, it's client server. They have your message. They're scraping all the metadata, which is all the data, personal data about you used to deliver your message. And they're keeping that and they're databasing that. They're not deleting that. You can trust that, that's worth money to them. So, oh, we're, we're deleting your messages. Yeah, after they scrape what they want. 
Shazzle never gets your message. You're not sending it to us. You're sending it to your recipient. We don't need it. We don't get it. Just to amplify that, too, I mean, we are private by design and architecture. We're not private by, you know, business model or legal agreement or encryption, all of which can be broken. As Cliff points out, you can you could put a wire shark on the communications and see what's going back and forth to the server. There are no messages going back and forth to the server that have anything other than login content. So it's not sending the data anywhere it can be collected. It literally goes from sender to receiver. There's no way we could intercept it if we wanted to. And it's verifiable at an architectural level. So it's something I think people really can have confidence in. Yeah, I I love the whole concept behind it. Um, I do a lot of communication with people around the world, right? Um, I talk to people in India. I got people in the UK. Uh, and, you know, to make a phone call to those places is expensive. And so, you know, um, that's where like WhatsApp comes in handy because I can make those uh, calls through my phone. Uh, but sure enough, those are not secure, um, even though they say that they are. So how do you differentiate, you know, I guess the idea of your guys's product, uh, what I'm saying is how do you get people to fall in line with understanding that your stuff is secure? Because we've been being taken advantage of for so long from the tech giants uh, that I don't think, I think people are numb to the fact that their data is being taken from them, you know? And so when, when you, when you say, trust me, it's just, you know, one of those things where, uh, you know, it's like, trust me, I'm with the government. I'm here to help your checks in the mail kind of thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, people are waking up to the fact that a lot of what they do on the web is discoverable and not private. And once they're waking up to that, they're looking for ways to protect themselves. The first thing they often look for is something that's secure. This usually means encrypted. That might be secure, but it's not private. In other words, people know you're communicating. They just can't read what you are communicating. What Shazzle is, it's private and secure. So it's fundamentally different and fundamentally better. Nobody even knows you're talking to the other person. Forget about the fact it's also encrypted on the way. There's no central routing authority that could tap in. Uh, so it's fundamentally different. And it's what I think Cliff and I want to say here is that privacy is actually the ultimate goal. Security is nice, but security can be cracked. And as Cliff points out, there's metadata, all kinds of information about the message that is still being tracked. Our goal and the reason that we got into this business and wanted to create something that was lasting for the world here is to create an architecture that establishes privacy. And privacy, we think, is the ultimate good. So, so and I want to speak. Yeah. I want to speak to how we get people to use us, which is, I think was part of your question. Yep. And our goal has been for the past dozen, dozen years to build a better mousetrap, to build a completely new architecture, patented architecture that gives people privacy and control that they have lost. And we do let need to let people know that. And one of the reasons we're doing that is your show. People that listen to your show are the type of people that are gonna care. They're the type of people who get involved in making decisions about what's right for them and what's right for their future. And they are the type of people who probably don't like being spied on. You know, they're aware, they're engaged. We need to reach out to people who are engaged so that we can explain how we're different. And we need to find some first movers who can understand the architecture and who can vet it, put a wire shark on it, beat it up, do whatever they want so that they then can latch on and say, hey, this is good for me and my group of friends. I want to let people know about this because we think it'll make a difference in privacy, which we need to preserve. We're also working with groups that are looking to preserve privacy through politics and law, including EFF and some others. And again, their first movers, the goal here is to restore privacy through the architecture rather than through the laws or through the business practices or what have you. And we need to find first movers. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Are you having trouble finding hand sanitizer? Well, Spa Treat has you covered. There's no need to go searching high and low. Just visit SpaTreatOfficial.com and place your order on their easy to use website. On schedule delivery. 
One of the great things about this product, Spa Treat Fulfillment Team is working around the clock to provide people hand sanitizer during this time of need and get your order to you as quickly as possible, even faster than Amazon. Spa Treat also has the lowest price of any of its competitors. Spa Treat has 62% alcohol content and the FDA recommends between 60 to 80 for maximum protection. This one has 62 because it doesn't dry your hands out. I use this stuff every single day. It is fantastic. It's got certified organic extracts with the ingredients in that hand sanitizer that are of the highest quality and they're designed to leave your hands smelling and feeling fresh while protecting you at the same time. The best part, there's no tricky residue left over. None. None of that sticky stuff. Four scents available, unscented, tea tree, lavender, and lemon. And best of all, this product right here is made in the good old United States of America. A lot of companies are having trouble dealing with the current demands, so Spa Treat has dedicated themselves to providing a much needed product in the time of crisis. Spa Treat has better prices, faster shipping, and a larger supply than any of their competition. There isn't even a close second. Visit SpaTreatOfficial.com and enter promo code SPA SPA at checkout to receive 5% off your entire order. That's right. Not only are they offering the lowest price available, but they're also offering our listeners a discount. This promo code is exclusive to Voice America and only our listeners get this discount. Spa Tree and Voice America came together on this sponsorship in order to provide Americans something they could really need right now. Peace of mind. Visit SpaTreatOfficial.com and order yours today. That's Spa SpaTreatOfficial.com and make sure you use the promo code SPA at checkout to receive 5% off your entire order. SpaTreatOfficial.com. Get your awesome hand sanitizer. For my next question, I I, kind of wonder, at at what point in your life, Cliff, did you decide like, oh, I need to build something that's more private and more secure than what we're currently using? Was there, you know, something that happened to you? Did you get your identity stolen or something like that that really caused you to drive towards building these tools? I started doing a lot more business travel, and this is maybe a dozen, 12, 13 years ago, and bring in a laptop and getting connected and started to think about where is this all going? And it caused me, not to panic, but it caused me to realize I wasn't in control of my own information. And I like being in control. I think there's a lot of value in being in control. Um, Because if you're not in control, you don't know what's coming around the corner. And I didn't like that feeling. So I'd say as much as anything else, it's part of my personality. It's like, eh, maybe I'm not a very trusting person when I need to trust third parties, I don't know. It's like, you know what? I trust people I know, I trust my friends. I've known Bob my whole life, I trust Bob. If I don't know you, why am I trusting you with everything I have? Why am I trusting you with all my business information, with all my personal communications? And so I started talking to Bob, we had had another technology business together um, and he first let me know, yeah, there's, there's no alternative, which I didn't like. So I'm crazy enough to say, well, let's build an alternative. (laughs) <laughs> well, and I, I think that's cool too, because that's also, uh, you know, part of the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit of America, right? Uh, you know, people, they identify these things and they go, you know what, I, we can do something better. Uh, and then we have the freedom and the ability to go and do that, uh, which is, which is inherently uh, a, a great feeling, uh, knowing that we have the freedom to go build those tools. Um, Except for right now, right? We we're all on lockdown with COVID nineteen and all of this madness. Uh, I really, I really feel like, I really feel like in this particular time specifically, some of my freedoms are being uh, infringed upon as an American with uh, stay at home orders and you know social distance and have to wear a mask at Walmart and all that stuff. Um, really doesn't really help, uh, you know, the the general civilian psyche when you're going through all of that. But knowing that there's a tool to communicate. Uh, that does make me happy, but you know, let's you know speak on society for a moment. I mean, this whole thing that's going on. I want to I, I want to talk about COVID because it's a perfect example. Yeah. People tell me I don't need privacy. I don't care. I have nothing to hide. And you talk about American freedom, and yeah, we have freedom that's the envy of the world. And 
we've been able to enjoy that freedom so much that we almost can take it for granted. The people that tell me I don't need privacy are taking their freedom for granted. Well, we learned with COVID how quickly the worm can turn, right? And if, if all your information on your life, on your political ideas, on your personal relationships is all collected centrally, and then the worm turns, and all of a sudden, let's say that uh, you know gay people are not you know we, we get a very reactionary government. Well, gay people, you know, we don't really want them in the workforce. We want to fire all people who are gay. Well, guess what? Bang! Snap your fingers. The government knows, and the tech giants know your sexual preferences. They know to a T. Believe me, you use the web. They know your sexual preferences. They know roughly how many sexual partners you have. They know whether you're faithful in your marriage or not. They know all of that. You get a government you don't expect and the world turns like it is now, like you have to wear a mask. No one could have imagined that six months ago, even imagined it. We wouldn't be talking about it. It'd be ridiculous. It'd be a cartoon. Yeah. How quickly did it turn? The time to protect yourself is not after the worm turns. The time to protect yourself is now. Yeah, and I think the inaction of the Patriot Act really uh, was kind of the, you know, the flag, so to speak, where I I perked up and was like, oh, my God, they're going to the government can now spy on us. Um, And that was really where all the data gathering for the government uh, probably had been happening before. But this made it legal. But the unpatriot act. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, the unpatriot act. And that and that's kind of scary, knowing that the government has that much control, which is why I'm so pro Second Amendment, right? Because uh, if they do turn the worm, we have to be armed and ready to go. Uh, you know, just just like our our forefathers who who uh, you know started the United States and all of the Declaration of Independence and all of that thing. The idea behind the Second Amendment was to be able to fight back against our own government in the event that they became tyrannical. And I kind of feel. In this particular instance with COVID-19, it's getting pretty close. I'll, I'll speak to that right there because your Second Amendment right is less protection if your enemy knows everything about you, all of your friends, all of your habits, all of your travel, knows everything about you. It's hard so to protect your data with a gun. Right. I was just going to say, it's, you, 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 gun protects your physical presence, but you need something to protect your information. And even with the gun, your physical presence, you know, your enemy knows everything there is to know about you. Now, you don't know where they're coming from, and they know where you're going because they know everything about you. Does that make you feel safe? Yeah, you got a gun. Doesn't mean they can't shoot you in the back because they know where you are. They know when you turn around. They know when you turn over in your sleep. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, especially with everybody wearing a Fitbit, right? That tracks your sleep habits, which goes to your cell phone. Which exactly. Then, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's why. I don't, and Ryan, why we I also have, have to concern ourselves <laughs> with uh, commercial privacy as well, right? I mean, it's perhaps not as dramatic as Second Amendment rights, but you know, do you want to be denied insurance because you drove to the wrong side of town, right? Do you want these large oligarchs knowing your complete medical history and being able to charge you extra because there's certain genetic tendency. These are things we need to discuss as a society, but in terms of protecting yourself, keep that information to yourself. And you don't have to worry about being discriminated against because of one thing or another in subtle ways as well. In everyday ways, it's creeping into our lives. Insurance companies are putting little chips in your car to see how fast you drive, right? You're giving away data there, you know? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I would say I'd sum it up. I'd sum it up in four words: get off the web. You want to read the news? You want to watch a TV show? Fine, go on the web. Go on YouTube. Watch that stuff. You know, but you want to communicate. You want to transact. Get off the web. You are not safe, and there's no way to make you safe. Yeah, that's that w- what we're going to allow people to do. That was going to be my Get next question is, is what are what are some, you know, things that you would tell the average citizen on, you know, ways that they can keep their 
uh, keep their data safe. Um, I mean, I know that you have the Shazzle chat application that allows you to send photos and videos and messages and all that uh, in that peer to peer environment. Um, but outside of outside of that, like, you know, I even feel like when I make a cell phone call through my phone number to another person, I, I still feel like that is, that's not uh, secure at all. You know, those can all be recorded and listened to and, you know, Verizon providing access to the government for those phone calls and stuff. Um, so that that's my question is, but well, at what point do we get to uh, being able to leverage our cell phone for voice communication uh, that doesn't get recorded or can't be tracked? Bob, can you speak to that? Because I know we're adding voice. Um, is that also going to be peer to peer? I remember talking about it, but I can't remember exactly how the technology works. Exactly. That's the goal. We're not there yet, Ryan, but the goal is to be able to enable all kinds of communication in private, voice to voice, video, messaging, pictures, etc. We're starting with Shazzle chat, but the same basic architecture of connecting people directly peer to peer off the web can be used for all different kinds of communication. So yes, that's well, exactly where we're heading. And I do want to add, we do support pictures and videos. So we support messaging, pictures, videos, data, you know, anything you can do, texting, we're going to add Shazzle mail to it um, and we'll add voice to it. We're talking months, not years. I mean, we have the core architecture done now. And as you said, Ryan, you're using it now. We also have a payments product. So you're going to be able to transact business and make payments with peer to peer privacy yeah that was my next question um, about like uh when, when do we get shazzle pay <laughs> shazzle pay it's probably it's it's works now um but we have to tie it into the financial services industry which we're working on to actually move the money um so we've got the technology working and we're working with merchant processors now um and we've got a layer in the banks and that probably be because we're dealing with banks it'll probably be a year yeah because um, i think a lot of might the, be sooner than that I, th I think a lot of the banks right now are using a service called zelle z-e-l-l-e -E, which allows you to send you know money to somebody with their email address um but again i don't i don't believe that that's you know private that's you know on the uh, client on, on the bank client server yeah client server web zelle is web get off the web yeah, because I do like a way to uh, be able to transact or send money to my friends. Uh, you know, every once in a while, uh, you know, like I send money to my mom. And so I use Zelle to send that to her. And it'd be great to have a, a different mechanism to be able to do that that was more private and secure. Because I don't really, I don't need anybody knowing my banking details other than me and the bank. <laughs> right. Yeah, you might not need as much privacy as some people. You know, you think about uh, think about that. But financial privacy is is also important. You know, as well as data privacy, communications privacy, voice, as you've mentioned. Um, we we can't give up, and we can't give it away. It's not free. And if we want to give it away, we should be paid for it. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely about at the tipping point here where. Uh, I'm glad that there I'm glad there's people out there in the world like you guys that are working on solutions for people because I think there's people out there that don't even know that they need this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, a lot of them. And our approach is we don't need to reach everybody. We need to reach that one half of one percent who understands the value of privacy and who is willing to commit five minutes to downloading an application inviting some contacts, figuring out how it's going to work and say five minutes, not that it's a big deal, but you know what? Five minutes keeps people from doing a lot of things, right? So you do have to invest a little bit of time and only people that are keenly aware and really care probably will do it. But once they do it, they're usually the kind of people who are very widely trusted because they're this type of people that understands things. And so other people are going to be influenced by them. And that's the way we see this thing unfolding. I cannot imagine that 10 years from now, our world's still gonna be communicating via the web because it makes no sense. I don't know if they'll be using Shazzle, but I think they will, because we have a patent, so they're, <laughs> they're probably gonna have to use this, but 
you know, they're going to use something like this. I mean, maybe someone comes up with a different idea that's not ours and not patented. And, you know, it may be something else, but there's, it, it's nonsense to use the web when you don't have to. It made all the sense in the world 25 years ago. The only way to communicate, and it was better than licking a stamp. Right, because looking a stamp took forever. I mean, I'm old enough that I remember those days. You send a business letter, you wait four days, maybe you get an answer. Um, no one would wait that long today, right? The web was great, was great. It's still great for broadcast. If you want to broadcast an article to a million people, you stick it on a server, a million people come to the server and get it. You don't need to do that when you want to send a message to your mom. You don't need to let a million people see your message to your mom which is what the web in theory does. Yeah, I was having a conversation. Dumb architecture. Yeah, I was having a conversation with a guy named J. Paul Duplantis, emergentweb.org. And one of the things that he was talking about was decentralizing the entire internet and making everything peer to peer. Um, and, 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 yeah. and, and so I really like the concept of that idea. Um, and so you guys are you know, further etching it in stone with your products and services with Shazzle that um, you know, that's kind of the way that a lot of things are trending. Um, tell the listeners, where can they find out more about Shazzle products and, and, uh, and, and all that stuff? Well, they can go to Shazzle.com or ShazzleChat.com and, and find, a, find it there. They can find it in the Android Play Store. Um, we should be in iOS um, perhaps at the end of May. It might be the end of July. Um, Apple has made it more difficult to launch a, a peer-to-peer app. Um, they are very much interested in controlling their users. And they don't want you to use your phone as a server. They want you to use Apple servers, right? Um, we have a workaround and, and we will launch, um, but I would caution iOS users that Apple does not want you to have privacy. You think you own the phone, but they control the use of your phone. We know that because we're building applications for their phones. They own the right to use your phone. You don't. You just pay for it. That's a scary thought. That. That's just scary. And for me, I had always it's stayed smart. I had always stayed away if from you Apple, own Apple products. stock. If you own Apple stock, it's a good deal, right? But if you paid money for that phone, you can't download the, uh, any application you choose to on your Apple phone. You can't, oh, this is a cool app. I want to use it. You need Apple's permission. Yeah, that's one of the things that always drove me nuts. Number one, I don't like Apple just because they are extremely overpriced. So that's one of the reasons I have stayed away from Apple. And then for me, you know, as a broadcaster and uh, as a content creator uh, from the video and audio perspective, I can build a PC that can annihilate what a Mac can do for half the price. You know, and so that's how I had always looked at, you know, the Mac versus PC uh, kind of world. Uh, never really thinking about it from that perspective, though. But you're right. Even when you're on your iPhone, um, you can't download an application without first signing into the Play Store or to, into their store. Whereas I know with Android, I don't have to sign in to go download an application. I can just go download any application I want without signing in. So there's some inherent differences between those devices. Absolutely. And I've said before that I, I like to be in control. I see value in being in control because I don't want to trust people I don't know. And Apple does not give you control. It's one thing to pay extra for a product, but after you've paid for them, you don't control the product. They do. That's just scary. I don't like that. No, I don't like it either. Yeah. Bob, what's, yeah, your, what's I, your take I on that? Use their product. Hey, Bob, what's your take on Bob, that? We, I know you're, you're the chief technology officer. What's your take on the Apple iOS? They have a walled garden. It's a very good walled garden, but as Cliff points out, you're not free to do what you want there. There's a lot more openness in Android. Even Android has some restrictions as well. But what we've been able to do is harness the power, the underlying power of the smartphone platforms to be able to build privacy. It's a little harder to do with iOS, but we're getting there. Do you find any challenges with um, the specs on hardware versus one or the other? Like, does do Apple devices have uh, you know 
better hardware, you know, RAM processing power than an Android phone, or are they pretty matched up if you have the latest and greatest of either one? I'd say they're pretty matched up. It, what I can tell you is it's not meaningful in the context of deploying our application. The application itself deploys just fine and functions just fine on both platforms. It's not so resource intensive that it would require, you know, a little bit of extra processing power that you might get with one platform or another. The real challenge is the software hurdles um, and the rules that Apple puts in place to prevent using certain features. We actually, the reason we're a little bit late with iOS is because we were using some features in their SDK that were deprecated, that were basically removed. So we had to re-engineer and use the new set of features and the, basically it became less functional. It's always a tough thing. You know, I bet you Steve Jobs would be pissed off at Apple right now. <laughs> <laughs> he he may well be. would. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you just think about the nature of him as a, you know, uh, a creator of very cool products and the reasons why he designed them. I remember watching the movie and one of the funny parts about the movie uh, uh, Steve Jobs is, you know, he's listening to a CD uh, and a pair of headphones and he just gets up and he just throws it in the garbage. And the next thing you know, the, the iPod was created. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's like, this yeah. is stupid. <laughs> I think you kind of like it. me with my stinking laptop when I was <laughs> business traveling. I'm like, this sucks. Yeah. I, I want to go back to one thing when we talked about other products that we're developing. We have a patent on a method of handling a private social network where you actually serve your own content and the Facebooks of the world don't have your content. It's the same thing with Shazzle Chat. If you put a picture on your page, Shadow Social Network, which again isn't available yet, but we do have a patent on our method. Um, and you decide later, hey, I'm going to take that down. It's down. It doesn't exist anywhere. You send something to Facebook, they own that picture. They own the rights to use your picture. They don't even not 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 not, not, not just to own the rights to the picture. The, I, Facebook is a feeding ground for <laughs> facial recognition software for the NSA and other government programs, and like that's been right. you know highlighted so far you know what the, the scariest thing for me um, I don't know if you guys watch this on the news you probably did but I remember when Mark Zuckerberg was talking to the Senate right and they're asking him all these questions about how their platform works and in my brain I'm going these senators are so old then so out of touch they don't even have the right questions to ask him Right. And I'm uh, right. about about privacy and how they're using the data. They, di they didn't even they don't even understand how the Internet works to a T to be even to be able to come up with questions to even challenge Mark Zuckerberg. It was the most it was the most painful thing for me to watch when that hearing was going on. I'm going, why are you asking these questions? These are really dumb. <laughs> yeah, well, that's Washington, D.C. So. As you mentioned earlier, one good thing about America is we do have enough freedom now and we're able to innovate and we have the creativity. You mentioned Steve Jobs, who certainly did a great thing for all of us uh, at the start and great thing for this country. Um, but it, maybe it got a little too ossified. Maybe it's gotten a little too hard and maybe unfortunately we lost them, right? Um, but we got to get back to that. We got to get back to having control, allowing innovation, preserving the freedom that is slowly being eroded. And do you think Jobs would have eroded freedom like this? Maybe not, you know, because he wasn't that type of guy, but that's where we are right now. We get these tech giants, they're feeding off your data. You're giving up your data for free. They're making the money and they want more and more and more and more. You're feeding the beast. You're feeding the beast with the Patriot Act. You're feeding the beast of the tech giants. Well, I don't want to feed the beast. And we've invested millions and millions of dollars over 12 years because we had it, because it's important to me. You got to leave a legacy somewhere in your life. My kids are going to be fine. You know, this is my, you know, Bill Gates can go out there and cure malaria and all these other things. You know, this is, this is my nonprofit. I mean, we're giving away Shazzle. You don't have to pay for it. And we're giving it away and we're not getting your data. You know, so we're really giving it away. <clears throat> See, I just I had I had to I had to let the crowd loose on that one, Cliff, because round of applause to you guys and what you're doing. Seriously, it's a, it's an amazing tool. Um, I really love where your guys' brains are, where your head is at, where you're looking, the direction that you're going. 
uh, and I appreciate uh, like-minded individuals in the space uh, in in digital that are really looking out for the the best interests of our common man. So. Uh, Cliff, Bob, thank you guys for what you're doing with Shazzle. Uh, again, you guys, I urge you to go to Shazzle.com, uh, ShazzleChat.com. Also, go check out the different features. I'm using Shazzle right now. Um, no one's paying me to say any of this. Uh, so I, I, I am a user of Shazzle. So go out there, go use it. Um, use the chat function. Send your your pictures and videos to your friends and you know, uh, know that it's going to be nicely uh, secured and not available on anybody's servers. Right, guys? Correct. Go get them. Yeah, absolutely. Get thank you, Ryan. off the web. <laughs> <laughs> Cliff, Bob, thank you guys right. for joining me on Finding Your Frequency. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, again, go check out the website, uh, shazzlechat.com. Uh, make sure you come back to the Variety Channel right here on voiceamerica.com every week as we bring you guys great interviews right here on Finding Your Frequency. Thanks for tuning in.